Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us once more for our ongoing virtual learning series, The State of Pregnant and Parenting Students in California. My name is Miguel Leon, Senior Program Manager with the Michelson 20MM Foundation. I use pronouns he, him, his, and I'm coming to you from Tongva ancestral lands. I'm a Latinx male with black hair combed to the side, brown eyes, black rimmed glasses, and I'm wearing a white button up shirt with a blue coat. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about the foundation. Founded by Dr. Gary K. Michelson and Alia Michelson, the Michelson 20MM Foundation is dedicated to ensuring that everyone, particularly our most vulnerable populations, has the access to the equitable post-secondary educational opportunities that lead to meaningful careers. We proudly operate at the cutting edge of higher education to help forward-thinking innovators nonprofits and startups close the opportunity gap. Our first session of this series dove deeply into the California State University system and asked what the student population looks like at the CSU level, what's being done to support them and what we can all do to help them thrive. Today, we're excited to uplift some examples of best practices that have emerged throughout California for helping student parents succeed You'll also hear about work going on outside of California that is generating even more support for student parents. The incredible efforts you'll hear about today are beacons of hope for many students. They represent a growing body of endeavors seeking to improve programs and policy for student parents. We invite you to join the discussion and share your stories on Twitter using the hashtag student parents. Our Twitter handle is at Michelson20MM. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our opening speaker, Alia Michelson. Alia is co-chair of the Michelson 20MM Foundation and Michelson Philanthropies. She is also the creator of FirstJet, a storytelling platform that celebrates global citizenship by highlighting how the immigrant experience strengthens the American story. Through FirstGen, Alia creates communal spaces for women to gather in celebration of their diverse experiences and shines a light on all the ways immigrant women positively impact our world today. A former journalist, an artist, a storyteller, and a philanthropist, Alia pushes our foundation to be innovative, to be disruptive, and to be creative. Welcome, Alia. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. My name is Alia Michelson co-chair of the Michelson 20 Million Minds Foundation and Michelson Philanthropies. Welcome to our ongoing virtual learning series, The State of Pregnant and Parenting Students in California. Today, we uplift hope. The hope that emerges from the hard work many of you are doing in support of student parents on college campuses across California. Despite myriad challenges, including minimum funding and tepid institutional support, allies throughout the state are leading inspiring efforts to help student parents thrive in their studies. The emerging best practices that will be uncovered today remind us that ingenuity, innovation, collaboration, and compassion can have a lasting positive impact on parenting students, be it a diaper bank, unique study spaces, or full-on student parent centers, our panelists will share what they have done to make their campuses more family-friendly. They are examples that have surfaced from listening to and prioritizing student parent needs as expressed by student parent voices. We hope that these bold solutions drive even bolder system and policy changes. As Dr. Mercado Lopez stated in our first virtual learning session, we have a lot of work to do to move from student parent awareness to student parent competency, and even work is needed to attain student parent serviness. I hope that today's conversation helps to cross pollinate the community that's coalescing around student parenting in our state. We at the Michelson 20 MM Foundation are in awe of that community and commit to nurturing it grows. Thank you again to our co-hosts and partners, Ascent as the Aspen Institute, Blue Shield of California Foundation, California Competes, Tipping Point Community, and the Education Trust West for being with us on this journey. 
to the pregnant and parenting student in our audience. We see you. You belong in college just like any other student. Hold on to your hopes and dreams and keep telling us how we can help you on your journey. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy today's conversation and implement the best practices within your respective institutions and communities. Thank you so much, Alia, for your remarks. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our amazing panel. With us, we have Haley Myers Dillon, MPPA. Haley is the director of Sacramento State's Parents and Families Program, the Student Parent Supports Program, and the Pregnant Student Services Program. She is the founder of the California State University Parent and Family Program Consortium, and recently convened the first ever CSU Student Parent Summit. Haley herself is a student parent working toward an EDD in educational leadership with a research focus on student parents. Welcome, Haley. With us, we also have Dr. Larissa Mercado Lopez. Uh, Dr. Mercado Lopez is a professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at California State University, Fresno. She teaches courses on women of color feminisms and Latinx health and currently serves as conference director for the annual California State University Student Success Network Conference. Her work is informed by her experience as a student parent and as an academic mother of four children. Good to have you with us once again, Dr. Mercado Lopez. Also joining us today is Dr. Rudy Nazarina Roy. Dr. Roy is an associate professor of child development and family studies at California State University, Long Beach. Her research interests revolve around cultural influences on parental roles across the transition to parenthood, enduring early childhood, fatherhood engagement, student parents, and multiracial families. She is a member of the National Council on Family Relations Board of Directors and is a certified family life educator through the National Council on Family Relations. Welcome, Dr. Roy. Moderating our panel today is Shade Johnson. Shade is a graduate assistant for Project HOPE at California State University, Fresno. She was born and raised by her parents in Madera, California, has 10 siblings, countless nieces and nephews, and is a wife and mother of two children. She, re she received her BA in African American Studies from the University of California, Davis, and is seeking her MA in Higher Education Administration and Leadership. Shade, thanks so much for your presence. And starting us off today is Dr. Autumn Green. Dr. Green is a research scientist at Wellesley Centers for Women, where she directs the Higher Education Access for Parents and Students Research Initiative. She is also a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute, where she works with the Income and Benefits Policy Center and the Building America's Workforce Initiative. Her forthcoming book, Surviving, Striving, and Thriving, Low-Income Mothers in Higher Education, documents the experiences of low-income mothers pursuing higher education in 10 states, situating their experiences within the systems and policy contexts that they must navigate to succeed in college. Dr. Green, thank you for joining us. The mic is yours. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to start uh, by introducing myself um, as um, I, I wanted to put my, my contact information in the chat. Um, and also um, just to share a little bit about my background in working in California. Um, so as Miguel was saying, um, I, I started doing my dissertation research in 2009 um, and immediately connected with multiple mothers in California who were um, experiencing a new, numerous challenges. Um, and um, so I, I am putting a link in the chat to an article that I wrote based on that research. Uh, but also have been working since that point uh, with colleges and universities in California and across the country on best practices to support parenting students in higher education. And so um, just to frame the panel a little bit, I'm going to be sharing um, some slides um, to talk more about that presentation. And I'm not seeing the slides coming. OK, there we go. Um, so um, the uh, just to start, um, this is uh, an, an issue that really affects um, a numerous people. And if you can just switch to the next slide, since I did introduce myself and my work, 
um, the um, this is really, you know, very importantly, a critical consideration for equity. Um, and I think that 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 has been something that's really been underappreciated, or at least in my experience working in this field. Um, so when we look at the statistics, and these come from uh, the National Center for Education Statistics Data Lab, um, so the National uh, Post-Secondary Student Aid Survey actually has information about both graduate and undergraduate students who claim dependent children on their FAFSA. Um, and we see that um, we're really talking about a very diverse population who does really well in school when they have the support to do so. So we see that, um, for example, 41%, we, we always hear about how student parents earn better grades than their peers. Well, 41% earn a GPA above 3.5 versus 29% of non-parenting students. So that's, um, you know, I think really an important con contextualization when we're thinking about um, this population. Um, by comparison, when we look at the graduation rates, I, I, you know, not that they are abysmal by any kind of fault of the students, um, and and just really wanting to stress that student parents are often working really hard to try and get through school and facing just a never-ending battle of trying to to stay in school, trying to do well in school while also balancing work and family and other responsibilities. Um, and so we see that baccalaureate graduation rates are particularly challenging um, when we're looking at pregnant and parenting students. Part of the reason why is because baccalaureate degrees take the longest amount of time to finish. And so we see um, that people in six years are much more likely to earn a certificate or an associate's degree than they are to earn a bachelor's degree. And there's actually some research from the City University of New York and the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth that found that it actually takes an average of 10 years for low-income mothers to earn a bachelor's degree. Um, and that's, again, the median or, median or mean average, I'm not sure which. Um, and um, so that means that some mothers are taking even longer um, and then, you know, the other thing, while we're not only talking about student mothers, uh, we are talking about a population that is 70% women. Um, and then when we look at the intersectionality issues, uh, when we're thinking about pregnant and parenting students, we're really talking about a, a population that is disproportionately represented among students of color. Um, so if we are looking specifically again at the Western Pacific region, which, which is where California is, um, we're seeing that 36% of black female grad students are parents, 41% of black male grad students uh, are parents, um, that we are also talking about a disproportional uh, percentage of uh, Latinx grad student uh, be being parents. Uh, we don't have the same level of data just because there's not as much, um, there's not as many students that, that are surveyed. And so the, the data isn't as robust as, as at the graduate student level, but we also see a huge, at the undergraduate student level, a huge disproportional population of um, tribal and indigenous uh, student parents, um, again, uh, black and African-American students. Um, Latinx male students are actually underrepresented. Um, among student parents, but that may also be because they're not being counted. And that's something we're going to talk a little bit more um, about as we get into talking about student parent data. So um, if you could just switch to the next slide. So I um, wanted to share about the Family Friendly Campus Toolkit. Um, and, and the work that we've been doing around family-friendly campuses. So I uh, partnered with Elizabeth Oshi, uh, Deborah Smith, and Joan Karp uh, back in 2013, actually, um, and did some foundational research in with uh, eight colleges and universities to build what became the foundations of the Family-Friendly Campus Toolkit. And one of those schools happened to be the University of California. Uh, we then... Um, partnered, uh, we received a U.S. Department of Education uh, FIPSI or Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education grant 
um, and partnered with an additional eight schools to actually develop and pilot the Family Friendly Campus Toolkit. And so the toolkit is one piece of a, a tool that, that can be used. It is a free open source tool and the, um, we'll put the link in the chat for the Family Friendly Campus Toolkit. Um, but also want to um, uh, just stress that the other side of the Family Friendly Campus Toolkit is really learning about what is already going on on campus at, um, in terms of, of family friendly practices. And that is where we uh, developed this parallel project, which um, is the students call find your way and that's kind of what I've been going with is uh, based on the student voice. Um, but we have been working in partnership with a number of student parent researchers who have been documenting um, systematically documenting the practices uh, and components of what is offered in terms of family friendly uh, campus practices at every college and university region by region or state by state, um, depending on the scope of their, their uh, piece of the project. So we're currently working on developing um, a new data set in partnership with the uh, Bridge to Hope at the University of Hawaii and a number of uh, individual student scholars throughout California around the Western Pacific region. And so I'm, I'm gonna share a few of the um, findings, but I'm also going to share a, a link where some of our students actually presented um, their uh, research at the Ohio State University's student parent monthly chat. Um, so again, it's there has to be an accountability kind of uh, lever that that um, because what we have found is that the number of parent of of campuses that have um, programs for, for parenting students or strategies for parenting students is actually pretty low when we're looking at across the higher education landscape. Um, and um, so how do we change that is really the question. And in part, well, I think that, that there's always room for expansion and that's part of the reason why the Family Friendly Campus Toolkit does have a Creative Commons uh, license really with it or with the idea of wanting to be uh, collaborative and, and be a, a continuously developing tool. Um, but, um, you know, that we can start with this, pro this process of, of really kind of going through what um, this process of development and self-assessment to, to figure out um, what your campus could be doing differently. Um, so if you can just switch to the next slide. Um, the Family Friendly Campus Toolkit begins with a, a starting with a campus-wide task force. So um, the thinking about um, who should be part of your task force, really not just thinking about um, the usual suspects, people like transfer student services, student parent services, um, sometimes I think basic needs is becoming more and more aware of, of parenting students, CalWORKs obviously, um, but um, also what are some other places that it would be really helpful to have somebody be a little bit more conscious of, of pregnant and parenting students in their work. Um, I was thinking this morning about, you know, the registrar uh, is a great place, not just um, in terms of priority registration, but also in terms of um, transfer uh, evaluations and, and things like that to, to make things a little bit more streamlined. Um, child care services, family housing, obviously, like there are some that are, that are very apparent, but, but I think, you know, when we think about admissions or marketing or um, that those can be really powerful places to have an impact too. And, and just kind of trying to really think about who are the unexpected allies, who are the people on your campus who might not have an obvious connection to pregnant and parenting students, but really possibly have a really meaningful contribution to make. Um, and then, so thinking about what does the task force do, um, really it's about starting a process. It's about starting a dialogue and a conversation. So it begins with collecting data 
Um, it begins with doing some self-evaluation in and identifying opportunities, developing strategies, and creating and implementing a campus-wide action plan. So that campus-wide action plan can be multifaceted. It might involve building a childcare center. It might involve um, expanding recreational services. It might involve just thinking about visibility and inclusion and belonging. Um, how could we have more student activities that are family friendly? Um, and um, the other thing I, I meant to, to say regarding the last slide is that there is a distinction between what it means to be family friendly, kid friendly, and student parent supportive. So a family friendly campus might be very family friendly for their faculty and staff, but not necessarily conscious uh, of supporting parenting students as part of that vision. Um, the uh, being a student parent supportive and family friendly campus uh, just means something a little bit more conscious about about being aware of the pregnant and parenting students on campus. And then being kid friendly means that kids are welcome on campus. Kid, there are places that kids have been actually consciously included um, and and thinking about the way in which um, you know parenting student identity is often very attached to their parent-child bond. Uh, when, you, when you welcome children to campus, you also are welcoming their parents at the same time um, and making them feel more included and valued. Um, so if we can just switch to the next slide to talk about what does this actually look like. So it starts really with data. Um, and I want to make the distinction between what is research versus program evaluation versus student enrollment data, because the, those can be a little jumbled sometimes. Um, and when we're looking for student enrollment data, we really want ideally to be able to not only count how many pregnant and parenting students there are uh, attending our institutions, but also be able to track the educational outcomes of those students. Uh, we also, hopefully want to be able to disaggregate special populations of parenting students so that we can see, for example, we know that single parent or solo parenting students have lower graduation rates even than the generalized parenting student population. They might need some specialized support. There, there, there might need to be some more attention there. We know that um, black, black mothers and Latinx mothers um, in higher education also have some unique needs. Um, and being able to see, you know, who might need some special attention to be able to achieve equity uh, is really helpful in terms of being able to use this data effectively. Now, what data is available is a little bit more limited right now. And that's been one of the, the big frustrations of my entire career so far is how do we get this data? And um, so we started with, um, we started with FAFSA. Um, and um, the FAFSA does include information about whether uh, your students are, um, uh, whether your students are pregnant or, or whether they claim a dependent child on their taxes specifically. Um, and I think that a, a, that distinction is important because there are many parenting students who might for some reason, um, many different reasons, not necessarily claim uh, their children uh, as tax dependents. Uh, single parents often are in a situation where the other parent are, is claiming their child. Um, there are people who don't file FAFSA at all um, for numerous reasons, including immigrants, uh, dreamers, undocumented students, um, as well as student veterans and uh, employer-sponsored students often don't file for uh, the um, FAFSA at all. And so they're not counted. And then on top of that, we also have other kinds of issues with the FAFSA. And so I put in the, the chat the FAFSA data sharing tree, um, which um, part of the, the challenge is that FAFSA, FAFSA data is protected by FERPA. And um, because of that, um, they, there is just some challenges with getting FAFSA data. Ideally, the data that we want to be able to use is institutional research data, which is recorded at the student records level. Um, we haven't seen a lot of use of this, but we have heard a lot of calls that, that 
this data should be included in IPEDS. For this data to be included in IPEDS, we have to be piloting and testing and exploring the possibility of student records level data, because that is the kind of data that goes to IPEDS. Um, if you can just, uh, I'm not going to put all of the, or go over all of these other um, issues, but but I do want to highlight the voluntary surveys um, and, and the difference between, it, it's one thing to collect data once, um, and it's another thing to collect data that can be tracked uh, to, to look at educational outcomes. Um, and, and also voluntary surveys, while I think they're really wonderful, and we have a protocol in the Family Friendly Campus Toolkit, about uh, to conduct a voluntary survey, um, the response rates you can't really depend on. Um, that, um, you know, so if you're trying to learn about what the challenges are that your students are dealing with, voluntary surveys can be great. If you're trying to know how many parenting students there are on your campus, you're probably going to get an underreporting um, just because student parents are very busy. And if it's not necessarily a priority for them, then, then um, uh, you know, it, it can just kind of fall through the cracks. So even if they were really interested and wanted to share um, at, or participate in a voluntary survey, sometimes it just doesn't work out um, because of the time challenges. So if you can switch to the next slide. So when we're talking about self-assessment and evaluation protocols, um, one of the things we're discovering is that it, it really starting with a legal compliance um, and internal audit um, uh, can really be helpful as a starting place because colleges and universities don't want to be out of compliance with the law, but often are unknowingly. Um, and so, just knowing what the laws are as far as Title IX, as far as California Education Code, um, and making sure that the that your institution is in compliance with the legal requirements pertaining to pregnant and parenting students, uh, lactation issues, and other um, issues that are part of the legal protections uh, in the state um, and in uh, federal law. Um, there are also some city codes uh, that also have some, some requirements that, that might apply uh, on your campus. Um, so then in addition to collecting data at the same time, also looking at student surveys, focus groups, how can we learn about who our students are? What do our students need? Because what we, what we know is that, that students Student parents are one of the most diverse populations in higher education and that we, what works on one campus might not be the priority on another campus or it might not be possible on another campus. So really kind of exploring what the capacity of the institution is, what services are already available, what's available in the nearby community and really developing a system around supporting parenting students on and off campus. Um, but also thinking about when developing those community connections and community partnerships, really developing a relationship directly with those organizations so that you're not just giving the students a phone number or an email address and saying, hey, I heard that they might be able to help, but actually connecting them with a person at that organization and doing a warm handoff versus kind of the, the cold call style approach. Um, so, these are just kind of a number of different ways of learning about your student uh, parent population um, in order to um, you know, develop this kind of action plan based on in, in response to their needs. Um, the piece about the institutional data, being able to really look at all parenting students, special parenting populations, do we have a, a parenting student program that stu certain uh, students are involved in? What's the impact of that program? Um, and then also being able to look at how student parents currently um, are co comparing equ equity-wise uh, to non-parenting students and to the general student population. Um, next slide. Um, and I... I'm probably going too fast, so I will put some uh, additional links in the chat in just a second uh, with some resources there. So again, thinking about if you're, um, how do you know as a task force working together whether the work that you're doing is effective? So not just self-assessing your institution's approach, but the task force self-assessing itself. 
Um, so are we setting realistic goals? Um, what have we accomplished so far? When is the goal met? When should, should we up it? Um, you know, if, if we set a realistic goal saying, hey, we want to increase the um, graduation rates by 10%. Um, okay, well, we reach 10%, but we also know that there's still an equity gap. So do we want to increase that goal and, and keep going uh, so that we're continuing to work towards equity? Or it, you know, at what point do we want to possibly redirect our, our focus on, on an additional goal or a special population that needs some additional attention? Um, also thinking about once you have made changes, how are those changes sustained? Um, and, and just kind of continuously asking, what's next? What could we, what could we do better? What, what else could be accomplished? Um, and, and continuing to kind of work through, um, you know, once you've completed one action plan and it's really successful, doing some self-assessment on how that's working and then where are there still gaps? Um, and this question of, you know, okay, well, when are we done? Well, it, you know, in the sense of equity issues, we're never really done because we have to at least sustain the system that is creating equity. Um, and um, if we're not reaching for equity related goals, I really challenge people to ask why. Um, and sometimes people feel as though equity is unachievable um, and that that you know, can be a really frustrating position to, you know, to encounter. Um, when we're talking about families who are really, really struggling for, you know, to achieve mobility and to, to achieve um, the same kinds of outcomes that have been promised to other students. And so, you know, it's okay, well, if equity is not achievable, why? And if that really is a barrier, then what could we do to address that barrier so that um, equity could be achievable? And that's, that's my continuous challenge to everyone. Um, and um, so I am ending my slides with a um, list of various components of a family-friendly campus toolkit, or I mean family-friendly campus components. Um, what does that mean? Um, this comes from both the framework for the family-friendly campus toolkit and also from uh, our Find Your Way protocol. Um, if, if you could just switch to the next slide. Um, and so I think that I actually got these a little backwards, um, but um, thinking about um, these are some of the more targeted uh, supports and, and services. We can definitely talk more about these on the panel because I know that there is, um, especially thinking about the relationship between uh, basic needs, family resource centers or student parent programs and CalWORKs offices. There, um, is an opportunity for some more uh, coordinated services. Um, and I think a lot of interest uh, from the people who are working in those programs in coordinating those services a little more clearly. Um, and, um, and then also just thinking about all of these different components that, that all of everything from services to programs to culture on campus um, can either be family friendly or in some cases can actually be hostile or um, unwelcoming to the point that it drives parenting students out of college. Um, and if you just switch over to the next slide, these, as I said, are, are things that are more um, student parent focused, whereas these are, are this list is more overarching um, institution wide practices. So with thinking about having kid-friendly places and spaces all over campus, um, there's some great examples of colleges and universities that have done this, that have study rooms, that have um, kid-friendly dining halls, that you know have really made an effort to become kid-friendly all over campus. Um, also, just really stressing the importance of uh, Title IX and other educational rights that are not necessarily known about or being enforced very effectively um, on a lot of campuses um, and equity accommodations, college marketing and outreach, faculty and staff training and engagement. I, I had this one wonderful but slash like awful experience where uh, one of my colleagues who uh, has studied this uh, population for many years um, 
her husband was a Spanish professor and, and had a um, situation where a student approached him and said, I'm going to have to take some time off because I'm pregnant. And he came home and he said, honey, I think that this is what you do, right? And she's like, no, this is what we all do. This is what we all do as faculty. This is what we should do. Um, but the fact of the matter is that usually faculty don't have training about these things. When I learned to you know, be a college professor, nobody said, hey, there's this thing called Title IX. And if you have students who are pregnant, you have to do this. Um, and the cultural practices around this um, have been you know, really awful in some, some cases where, you know, faculty even very well intended, um, you know, advice saying things like, oh, well, you know, maybe you should take the year off so that you can have your child and, and um, you know, take, take some time. Um, or maybe, you know, you should drop your classes or reduce your course load. Or um, I, I know I have personally experienced as, as have many other people like um, academic sanctions related to pregnancy or parenting. Um, and those are actually not, um, they're a violation of federal law, but most people don't know. So how do we do that? Um, it starts with faculty and staff training, but also sometimes Title IX um, uh, administrators also need that um, uh, training as well. Um, and uh, as I said, I've been kind of trying to race through the slides so that we can get to the panel. I think we've got a really great panel to talk about how all of these different um, components are falling into the work that they're doing on their campuses. And I'm really looking forward to getting into that, but I will put some more uh, resource links in the chat. Um, oh, so this is my last slide. So just um, sharing some communities of practice. Uh, if you are interested in connecting with other folks who are doing um, work around pregnant and parenting students on their campuses, this can be a really great way to get ideas, um, to check in about different challenges or strategies. Um, Marissa Weiss at UC Davis hosts a monthly student parent uh, program colleague chat, um, as does Marianne DeMario at Monroe Community College in New York. Um, those are two separate groups, uh, but um, either one of those groups, I think, has, has issued an open invitation to anybody who's interested in being part of that. NASPA's Adult Learners and Students with Children Knowledge Community um, is another place to connect. Uh, the symposium that is next uh, month uh, that is hosted by Ohio State, and then also um, you know, giving props to Haley for organizing the Student Parent Summit. Uh, and the Michelson Foundation and the CSU Systems Change Partners for the work that you've been doing around um, building some best practices for the CSU system. Um, and then also, I, I was really curious because I know that there are some campuses that have already used the Family Friendly Campus Toolkit in California. Um, and I listed some of those here on the slide, but also I'm really curious if you are using the Family Friendly Campus Toolkit a lot of the time, I, you know, I'm not aware of that until somebody tells me, hey, we've been using it. And um, so, you know, would love to hear more about that too. And uh, open it up now for the panel. Thank you, Autumn, Dr. Green, for just um, your presentation. It definitely spoke to me when you talked about the length it takes for student parents to finish their degrees. And I was like, oh man, I thought I was the only one that took 10 years, but it's just great to have the data and just the fact that we're here today and we're trying to change that so that it could be less, maybe, you know, four years for student parents will be our next goal. But also thank you to Miguel for introducing all of us and to 20MM Foundation for the Michelson Foundation for even putting on this webinar and bringing awareness to student parents and just the, these are the best practices for student parents, and I feel like it only increases every year. Um, and from the first year that I was a student parent to where I felt like I had no support, by the time that I left UC Davis, there was more support, and I know that it's just going to keep increasing. But now we're going to start the panel discussion where we have some amazing doctors and we have Haley for, who put on the first summit at Sacramento State um, and we're all passionate about student parents and advocating for them and implementing policies that will be centered around their needs. So the first question I have for our panelists is what are one or two programs on your campus that you implemented at the campus and that has been impactful from student parents? And how are you weighing that impact? So 
I can go first. Um, thank you, every everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all the advocates on the Zoom call and, um, and in the chat. It, these webinars are always just so inspiring for me. Um, and really provide a lot of the, um, the motivation that I need to keep going, um, especially during these times when it's, it feels so much harder to, to do things. Um, so let me talk about a couple of things that we're doing here at Fresno State, one of which is not my idea, um, but um, I was part of the implementation. So I'm gonna talk about our diaper bank and then our data collection mechanism. So our database, our sorry, our diaper bank was the brainchild of um, Dr. Jennifer Randall. She's a faculty in sociology and is a prolific researcher of diaper need. And her work looks at the one in three mothers um, specifically that experience diaper need and the implications of diaper need for like family equality, for mental health, for job and educational opportunities. And those of us who've had young children, we know and have put them in daycare know that we need diapers, right, in order to have our children attend daycare. And cloth diapers are not always feasible. They can be expensive and time consuming. Um, and so in her research, she found that you know, when parents can't afford diapers, they use other household items such as napkins or other absorbent cloths and they, or they find ways to stretch their diapers. And so for our student parents who are already experiencing time poverty and are low income and need diapers to stay employed, um, diapers are, are crucial to their well-being and um, to their advancement, to, to their children's well-being. So as part of a team that established the bank, and it was an idea that was submitted to our Bold Ideas um, contest, and it won, and they created a team around it. It was really Dr. Randalls who led the effort to get us registered with the National um, Diaper Bank Registry. That allowed us to be an official distribution point. And so the Central Valley Food Bank, um, they received $2.5 million of a $10 million three-year grant um, that came from the state, thanks to assembly member Lorena Gonzalez. And so Fresno State, because we were registered in official diaper bank, we were able to be a point of distribution. And since 2019, we have distributed an average of 30,000 diapers a month, um, going as high as 50,000 diapers a month. So at 100 diapers a student, that's an average of 300 students served um, a month, which you know, 100 diapers, I mean, that's about a tank of gas these days. <laughs> um, and, you know, not only is it supporting our students financially, but it's also um, creating the perception that they belong, right, and that our campus recognizes their needs um, as student parents. Um, the, the challenge with assessing the, the impact is that we, um, there are strict guidelines um, because of our affiliation with the food bank. We can only collect certain kinds of data that doesn't really allow us to keep track of, you know, maybe what are the implications of taking advantage of the diaper bank for retention, right, or for degree completion. So we can't really um, assess that. And we're also not allowed to, um, to advertise very publicly that we have a diaper bank. So there are some limitations around our ability to advertise and then to assess our data. So speaking of data, I'll do this very quickly. I don't wanna take up too much time. Um, we are the only CSU campus to collect data on students with dependents. In 2016, I conducted a survey of student parents and was able to use that to advocate to the cabinet for a more formalized um, data collection. And so I worked with our campus registrar and our IT office to create a page in our student portal where students can submit information related to their dependents, such as the relationship of them to their dependent, the um, percentage of care provided, percentage of financial support. And just uh, very quickly, the way that we define dependent is um, a dependent is broadly defined as a child or adult for whom you provide care and or financial support, and the dependent does not need to be a biological relative. So that opens it up to you know, other types of, of caregivers. 
And so we've had to do some education around the tool because um, the page with the tool doesn't explain what the data will be used for. Um, but we did make sure to include data fields that wouldn't be considered invasive or privacy sensitive. So, you know, it's an imperfect system because it's voluntary. Um, some students have misinterpreted the dependent question. Um, so they said that they're, they're, they like switched around, you know, their relationship to the, to the child or to their parent. Um, and so right now what we have is raw data. And I think Autumn had mentioned like capacity issues related to like data collection. So our institutional research office is very, very, they're overwhelmed right now. Um, so I'm hoping to at some point um, work with them to clean up the data and then really start looking at um, you know, the intersections of like inequity categories and to look at, you know, um, student parent retention and degree completion. I think I, I kind of froze, but um, yeah, so that's something that we're doing right now. And um, we are, we're very glad to um, have something to start with. I just wanted to jump in there because I think that what you've done um, at Fresno State, uh, Dr. Mercado Lopez, is really, really useful in terms of categorizing students who are parenting as a verb, but may not necessarily identify as parents as a noun. Um, and um, that this is something that I'm hearing uh, really across the board. Um, is really critical and important that there are students who are parenting who don't necessarily consider themselves parents, um, that you have step parents or you have guardians or um, sometimes uh, older siblings who are performing a parenting role, um, grandparent caregivers, um, all kinds of different diverse caregiving situations. And that is something that we have talked about. Um, I was part of the legislative action campaign for Senate Bill 564 in Oregon, which requires institutional records level data um, is reported at the state level now. Um, and that's going through a process of implementation now. It is very limited in terms of the questions that can be asked. It's just two questions. Um, but really, the, the spirit of that movement being um, having been kind of created by and for parenting students, them slash ourselves, um, that um, was always about making sure that we're counting everyone, thinking about all of the people who aren't being counted, who are being left out. Um, and, and part of that includes students who are caregiving um, and parenting, but not necessarily parents. Um, and so the wording of, of that actually says, um, that, that a question or questions will be uh, authored by the Higher Education Coordinating Committee, which is the, the State Department of Higher Education in Oregon, asking whether a student is a parent or acting in the role of a parent. Um, and um, a st few students from City College of San Francisco actually said, you know, I would really prefer to say serving in the role of a, of a, of a parent. And I, I thought that that was a very interesting distinction to just um, echo because I, the the idea of acting versus serving um, seemed to be very salient. Um, and so I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to take what you've been doing at Fresno State um, and look at how that could, could apply kind of through California um, in a similar way. Thank you, Dr. Green, for answering that. And Dr. Roy, would you like to put your input in on question one? Sure, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I have some people doing construction outside. So if I automatically mute myself, that's why. Um, I, I think that, you know, we, we've done several things on our campus to support student parents. A lot of this work started back in um, 2014 when we put together an advisory committee of um, faculty, student affairs. I mean, really, um, the associate vice president of student affairs was really instrumental in bringing us all together. We had psychologists, counselors, um, people who knew of student parents and really wanted to do more advocacy and support. Um, but one of the programs that I think has been really um, impactful 
uh, in addition to the regular services that most campuses have is our family friendly um, study area on campus. We have uh, a special room outside the children's library on our campus that we've designated for student parents. Um, and one of the things we've done that I think is unique is we've partnered with um, service learning students in the area of child development and family studies. And those students sign up for 20 hours of service um, across the semester. And they are just present in that room. Um, we had funding to buy resources, um, activities that those students could do with children. So pre-COVID, it was quite successful. We had um, student parents come study um, and their children were being engaged uh, by child development students. I think one of the things that program really taught us was that, you know, we think we have these great ideas, we, we build it, hoping that students will come, but we learned, uh, and we learned this because service learning students were in the room, that other students were walking in and shushing children and telling parents that they needed to take their kids out of the library. Um, so we had to create signage that said, you know, this is a family friendly study area, please don't shush children. Um, so I think it, it's great to have kind of hands on um, front line work going on and being present because we don't always know the experiences of student parents, you know, we, we hear about it after, but then having other students who can be advocates. Um, I think that the service learning component of the family friendly study area benefits both the student parents, but also our students who were preparing to go out there and work in the field. Um, we really see our student parents as a unique population um, that need uh, specific types of services and um, doing work like that and really getting that information out on campus of that space that we have for them. Um, I think students well, they often tell us in, in the work that we do with them, qualitative research, or even in our classes, that they they don't want people to know that they're a student parent. They don't want to feel like um, no one wants to work with them. Oh, they have additional responsibilities. That they might not be a good classmate or a group partner. Um, and so, you know, those that, that's heartbreaking to hear um, because we've also found that student parents are the most determined. Um, they're most goal driven, they want to get their degree and get out, um, and they just want to have a fair chance at that. And so creating spaces where they feel comfortable to, to study, but also have support um, with childcare, I think uh, is one thing that we've done that's, that's uh, been, been really, has gone well. And during COVID, we've started to um, do online sessions, like Zoom sessions, where our service learning students would you know, do an activity with children online um, and we advertise that and that did not work as well. I think families are zoomed out, um, but yeah, what we will continue uh, what we do with, with the service learning students in that family friendly uh, study area in the library. Thank you so much, Dr. Rory, for telling us the programs that are being impactful at your campus. And Haley, what is going on at Sacramento State? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Sacramento State, um, a couple of the programs that we've initiated that are going really well. One is a, um, a village building initiative to teach faculty and staff how to treat student parents and how to approach pregnant and parenting students. And I'm going to post a link to this video in the chat. Um, we have a um, an initiative called Wellness Ambassadors through the CARES program that we're partnering with to teach um, staff directly. And so this is a video that I created for them. And if you'd like to copy it to utilize at your own campus, please feel free to do that. Um, we also instituted um, quite a while ago, just when the pandemic began, we have a student parent community chats every other Wednesday night at 8.30 PM. And I have a student assistant who joins me at those and she's a um, master's in social work student assistant. And it's a place online at a time after some people's children are in bed to connect. And it's always very well attended. I think people from what I've learned, you know, and we all know, right? Student parents have a sense of isolation at Sac State. Student parents um, 
a third of student parents have reported that they have never interacted with another student who has a child or is pregnant. So there's this um, sense of isolation. And of course, these their margin, student parents are marginalized community. Um, the normative experience is that traditional age student, right, 18 to 24. So these students like getting together and talking to each other on Zoom. Um, and it really helps combat the isolation. They're not alone. And, um, you know, that's a good one. Another one we have is we have a voucher program through our C campus grant for uh, to pay for students child care and one of the ways that we utilize um, the C campus monies which can be flexible if you write your C campus grant in a flexible way is that we hosted a day camp for older children on Saturdays ages 5 through 15 in conjunction with the Children's Center on campus. Um, so student parents who had children who were young that could attend the Children's Center, but also student parents who were older, um, right, because student parents, kids who are older have a hard time sometimes finding care um, in specialized circumstances. So we were able to serve both those older children and the younger children and had sort of um, a fun and activity based day camp so student parents could study. Um, those are some things that have been really successful. Um, and of interest here at Sac State. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. I feel like it's very important for us as, as student parents to even feel like for the longest, I felt like, man, this is the part of my life that I'm going to keep off campus because, you know, they'll say family friendly. And as Dr. Green talked about, it may be family friendly for faculty or staff, but it's like some place where if my kid makes a noise or something makes it, makes him laugh, it's like, okay, why are you, why is, why is your kid here? So it's very welcoming and heartwarming that you guys are changing it up there and it's that we could just bring our kids to class. <laughs> but the next question that I have for you guys is how have you pieced your efforts together in terms of funding? Because you talked about C care and being able to pay for child care expenses. Like, is it sustained? What do you envision for the scalability of it? And how do you see that happening? And I can go with you, Dr. Green. So um, funding for student parent programs can be tricky. Um, at at the, the very basic level, um, I think that your institution should be funding student parent programs in the same way that your institution funds programs for other diverse student populations, for uh, traditional students, that, you know, that there are internal funding mechanisms that already exist. Um, now, can we rationalize that all the time? Not without the data, um, but with, with the data, um, I've seen, for example, um, uh, Portland State University, uh, which is uh, in Oregon, um, is, is a great example. They, when they did get the data, they discovered that there were 7,000 parenting students approximately on their campus. They were able to take that data to the ASP PSU and get the student government to allocate some student fee funding to fund a child care subsidy program. Um, they also fund a number of other student parent activities and student services through student fees. Um, now, you can't make that argument, um, you know, if people are still kind of functioning under, under the myth that parenting students are a niche population that, that, you know, and we hear this kind of all the time where I've had students come to me who have gone to their dean of students or gone to their college administrations and said, we need more services, more programs, more recognition for parenting students on our campus through whatever strategy. Um, and the, that administrator has said, well, you know, I, I just don't think that there's that many of you on, you know, on campus and we, we just can't justify the funding. Um, and so getting the data um, often is the first step to getting the funding. And the other thing I just wanted to say, and I know that Haley can, can stress this too, but as a C campus um, grantee, that you cannot even qualify for the C campus program if you do not know how many parenting students you have on your campus. You can do that through FAFSA data, you can do that through institutional records level data. Some people are doing it through surveys, but most people it sounds like are either using FAFSA data um, or trying to kind of develop this uh, institutional records level strategy. Um, but you can't even qualify without data. So data really is the first step to getting funded. Now, sure, there are other sources of grants and other things that, that can be braided in to help supplement, but I think that at the core foundation, 
that in order for programs to be sustainable, it does require an institutional uh, investment. Thank you, Dr. Green and Dr. Ricardo Lopez. Uh, yeah, so I want to echo all of Autumn's points about um, needing the data, um, but just to repeat something that I mentioned in my previous webinar and that I mentioned related to everything I'm involved in on campus is, um, you know, having the data is great, like it gives us precision, it allows us to really focus and target our efforts. But we don't always need data to start acting, right? We have, there's lots of literature that already exists about best practices and just having a philosophy about what's right, right? Having a philosophy about equity and democracy. I feel like, you know, if in the absence of data, we should be promoting that, right? Why should we support this population? Why is it critical to the recovery of California, right? Why is it critical to, um, you know, the, the strengthening of an educated citizenry? Um, I mean, there are all kinds of philosophical and political reasons and just moral and ethical reasons to support the population. Um, as far as, you know, funding, I try to leverage all funding um, opportunities and sources. So, you know, we have a C campus grant. I was able to um, write in some drop in um, coaching for student parents. Um, you know, the diaper bank, the funding runs out, I believe, this year, but um, we were able to uh, have the student cupboard absorb those costs. So, hopefully, we'll be able to provide the same. Uh, number of diapers um, supported by the cupboard and being part of that registry, that national um, diaper bank registry allows us to purchase diapers very low cost. Um, and I also, you know, use a GI 2025 student success call <laughs> to um, get some funding to do some work on um, some student parent competency modules for faculty. So I'll be working on that this summer. So there are, all, there are ways of, of leveraging all of those existing um, supports and connecting student parents to student success. And you know, I think all of these projects and initiatives are scalable. Um, it's a matter of you know doing that advocacy on on your campus, and I find that you know when one CSU campus sees that another CSU campus is able to do it, then that creates more of a sense of possibility. So that's why you know it, webinars like this are so important because we're sharing what we're doing. We're saying yes, it is possible, and yes, there are you know some differences in our student populations across the system. But there are some characteristics of our student population that are very, very similar. Um, so, you know, anytime that we can share information about what's possible, I think that that then helps to create some momentum to um, try to get things done on, on other campuses. Thank you, Dr. Ricardo Lopez. And it it makes me think, I guess the way we can institutionalize it, we can have philosophical policies, just being, just having good policies overall, moral policies that will make it to where these marginalized groups and students, parents specifically are benefited. But the next question I'm going to ask at first, Dr. Roy, it's how do we institutionalize these best practices at an institutional level? And even at the policy level, what is your campus doing that you see working? Um, well, as I mentioned before, the, creating that um, advisory board where we have members from all levels of our campus system um, on, we have a uh, university office of the ombudsman on our committee. Um, we really try to make sure that the information is being shared across campus. Um, and I think that's where you see change happening. I think so often on university campuses, people are doing great work, but they're doing it in their own little silos and offices aren't talking to faculty, faculty aren't talking to um, student affairs. You know, you, you might get a call from uh, the Dean of Students and, and I've had those calls and she's wonderful, um, but you don't really know of any concerns unless there's an issue. And I, and I think our um, advisory committee has really allowed us to have a, a better flow of communication across all the systems. And I think that's where um, institutions can make a, a lot of change. I also think that um, 
having an advisory board such as the one that we do um, allows for a lot of creativity to occur. You know, uh, someone can have an idea and not knowing the amount of grants, availability of programs and student affairs as faculty, you know, being able to be creative and create opportunities for um, all of our students to make it an inclusive experience. I think uh, that's really how you make change. Uh, I believe that we are a very student centered campus and we want to do things that are driven by students. Um, we have a commissioner um, in our S I ASI program uh, that's focused on uh, pregnant and parenting students. And so really having the buy-in of the student body, um, seeing the importance of this work, I think uh, is, is fundamental in making um, institutional changes. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Roy. And you talked about councils and committees and advisories and just having our ASI have a, maybe a Senate that's on board with pregnant, pregnant and student parenting students, I mean, student parents. And I want to know, Haley, what is going on at CSU Sacramento? Have you used those same, <laughs> I know the lights are off, but have you used those same um, committees or councils to help institutionalize these best practices? So to institutionalize best practices here, um, we have not really had the same approach, but um, I mean, you know, getting your campus partners on board is essential. Um, and working with ASI, actually, ASI is a really important campus partner as well. Um, you know, what I can say about that is, you know, we need to tell student parent stories, use those images and the campus materials, right? We want to see successful student parents with their kiddos. Where are these people in the brochures and on the websites? That's what I wanna see, um, you know, include those photos. I would say for faculty, you know, if you wanna reach out to faculty, I feel like we do this work well in student affairs, but we don't always, you know, cross over to the people who are interacting with the students so much. Sure, you can put a statement in the syllabi and that's great. Um, but, you know, for faculty, you can go to new faculty orientation and request a, you know, 10, 15 minute um, uh, set to inform, you know, with a one pager or whatever about student parents and their needs. You can also go to faculty senate and do the same thing, just two minutes and speak on student parents needs or better yet, um, you know, train a student parent to speak on their own story and come in and advocate. Um, you know, thinking about those policies, the family friendly policies, are your attendance policies punitive? Are they hurting student parents who might have a sick child? That's a really easy one. Um, you know, for faculty considering who has caregiving responsibilities. And I think another big one is counting, you know, counting, we've talked a lot about data, counting pregnant students. Pregnancy is a temporary status, but it's an interesting data point to think how many pregnant students are being served per semester on campus. I think it's an important data point. Um, those are a few ideas. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yes, I remember when I was pregnant in my second to last year, and I was just like, soon as I just kept getting told, like, soon as you're not pregnant, you're in a different status. I'm like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> it just wasn't a smooth transition. So I guess the final what another question is like, what are the recommendations for policymakers looking to support um, pregnant and parenting students? Um, Haley just talked about how that's an interesting data point. What could be a better policy from pregnancy well, as you're transitioning from pregnant to parenting? I will give it to you, Dr. Roy. Sorry, I need to unmute myself. Um, I, I think that's a really good question. And I think that um, when, when we think of, you know, university-wide policies, um, we, we have to consider that our pregnant parenting students have unique needs. We actually did a, a campus-wide study and, and found that our pregnant students actually reported more anxiety um, than our students who are parenting. And so whether it's the unknown of what to expect as a student parent, I think that sharing that information across campus, and we did several presentations um, with different offices across campus sharing this information of understanding that you know, there, there's a reason why we need to support um, all students, particularly students who become parents during their time on our campus. And I think policies um, that, that can support students as they make these kinds of life transitions um, while on our institution um, campus is, is really important. And I think sharing the stories 
of success, but also challenges that our students face is extremely important to inform policy and what needs to be done um, to shift and support students more. I completely agree. I feel like this story is always the thing that everybody glorifies, but then it's like, what, where was everybody when the struggle was happening? Where was the policy changes? And, you know, it, it makes, I value my story. I always like keep it near and dear to me because I don't want to just share, like, it could have been easier, but it wasn't, but it's my story. And I feel like those stories are uplifting and they should be out there, but I, they got to get easier. <laughs> so for the same question for you, Dr. Marcada Lopez. Okay. The, the question was about the policymakers, right? Yes. Or, what are your recommendations? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I think, um, you know, first getting a really good sense of, of the, the issue, right? There's lots of literature out there. There's data that they could start from. Um, they can use that to start to think about, you know, what are the baseline services and resources that are needed to support student parents and are our campuses um, offering those? Um, and then they can reach out to campuses um, to find out that information, you know, start, starting with basic needs, transfer student centers, um, um, child care centers. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's also important to garner support from other policymakers and bring them in, in a, in a coalitional way. Um, so, you know, I think that one way to do this too, because, you know, there's such a stigma associated with student parents still and I think that you know there's there's still some resistance to supporting them um, if you have to you know connect student parent support to our recovery efforts um, you know one of uh, or single parent or single mothers um, are uh, is a group that has one of the highest return on returns on investment um, so think about supporting student parents as a way of investing in and you know, uh, impacting multiple generations at one time. Um, you know, we talk about our students as future leaders, and, but in the case of student parents, they're already leading, right? They're leaders in their households. They're coaching t-ball. They're advocating for their children's education. So it's an investment in our leadership here and now, and in the future. Um, and I think that we also need to leverage our amazing student leaders. And I think, you know, Haley spoke to, you know, leveraging our students, right, to gain uh, momentum. Our um, CSU student trustee, Maria Linares, just gave a, a powerful testimony before the Higher Education Committee in support of AB 2881. And that bill, um, it would grant priority registration to student parents at community colleges and um, CSUs. I think it recommends priority registration for UC systems. Um, it also um, asks for campuses to advertise all of their student parent resources on their website in a very clear and accessible way. And then it also encourages more outreach and education around um, WIC and, and SNAP. And so she gave this powerful testimony and it led to a wonderfully intimate conversation afterwards where folks were sharing their stories. And I think that that is um, creating important and strong momentum to eventually propose and pass even more impactful bills such as mandating student parent data collection. Um, yeah, so those are a few of the thoughts I have about that. Thank you so much. And for Dr. Green, what are your recommendations? And if you want to touch on the um, Title IX policy and what would be your recommendations for that, we would greatly appreciate it. Yeah, so the, I think that everything that everyone said about, about policy really is important and it matters, that especially the piece about really having parenting students lead um, having parenting student voices at the center of those conversations and leading those conversations. Um, even I think that, um, you know, as parenting student alums, um, that that we uh, are often, you know, the, the my colleagues and I are very conscious about not standing in the voice, of, in place of the voice of people who are parenting students now. Um, and and thinking about, you know, what, is, what does allyship mean in terms of actually really being there to elevate and amplify those students' voices. Um, and, you know, I'm really glad to hear that, that your students were able to pr 
present and testify in support of AB 2881. I know uh, a few other parenting students who also testified uh, in support of that bill. Um, and um, that that those are the exact kind of, of moments that we need to be facilitating um, so that um, you know, parenting students really feel that their voices are being heard and, and not just being heard, but, but being centered in those conversations. Um, but the other thing I just wanted to emphasize because, and, and I think this, this relates directly to Title IX, and I'll put lots of links about Title IX and other things in the chat, um, but um, we can't, um, you know, legislation doesn't work. Uh, policy doesn't work if it's not enforced. Um, and so one of the things that we're learning, I think Title IX is a great kind of national example, but also um, there are numerous uh, examples in California's state educational code where this is already a policy and it's not being enforced. There's no, um, so for example, we know that um, uh, parenting or pregnancy is, is a protected class under Title IX, um, yet there is no data whatsoever being collected about uh, students who are pregnant. Um, so we have no way of even knowing whether or not they're achieving equitable outcomes. Nobody's bothering to count or pay attention. Um, so we have some qualitative anecdotal kind of um, data um, that can be used to tell the stories of people who are have experienced numerous forms of discrimination and exclusion and very problematic um, violations of their civil rights under the current law um, that I think are, are powerful and important. I'm a qualitative researcher by training, and that 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 is that is data that that you know. But but when we can see um, that pregnancy is actually um, setting students back on you know a systemic level in the data as well, it can it can amplify that. But at the same time, um, so I just put in the chat three different um, California state laws uh, that, that pertain to pregnant and parenting students that are already laws. Um, and what I'm seeing is that a lot of those, those policies don't seem to be being enforced right now. And so, you know, that's always my question is, okay, well, what's the enforcement mechanism? What's, what's the, um, so one of the things uh, in AB 2881, which is the legislation that we were currently talking about as pending in the legislature right now, there's a requirement that every college must have a website that includes lists of resources for pregnant and parenting students. Well, who's checking to make sure that each of those colleges have a website? Who's checking to make sure that the, they get updated? Um, because one of the, there's already a law on the books that says that every college and university in the state of California must include uh, in, per, uh, prominently displayed information about pregnant and parenting students' protection, protections under Title IX, yet our students found uh, that 40% of California's public colleges and universities and about two-thirds of all California institutions of higher education are not in compliance with that law as it currently already sits on the books. Um, so how can, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter if it's law, if it's not enforced. It doesn't matter if, if you know, if, if we do all this work to make something policy um, and then people are just not following it. Well, what's, what's the follow-up? Um, and I think that that is part of the question that, that needs to be asked that isn't necessarily always brought to the table Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Dr. Green, and sharing those links, because I feel like Title IX is such a tricky thing, and you have to be informed if, if, if your school and your institution is actually going by the law on that one. But um, we, I want to thank the panelists for answering all these questions. We're going to open it up to the audience. I want to know in the audience what schools are being represented. I know I'm from Fresno State. Is there anybody else from Fresno State? Is Long Beach here? Put it in the chat, and we could just shout it out. So we have CSU Long Beach in the house. We have Monterey Bay, Fresno State, San Diego State, Fullerton. Let's see if we get all three. Cal Poly Slow, CSULB. We thank you guys for coming. Oh, Texas Women's University. Yes. Oh, goodness, it's going so fast. <laughs> 
um, CSU Dominguez, we we appreciate you guys appreciate you guys for coming, and I want to open it also up for you guys to have any questions. So we have one question already in the Q and A, which is when uh, the panelists were talking about registrar's office. Um, uh, they wanted to know, one of the um, the participants wanted to know, how did the registrar's office know who our student parents is on our campuses and how do they facilis facilitate priority re registration? If Dr. Green talked about how they, they don't have access to FAFSA data, what tool is used so that they can know who to give priority registration to? I can tell you how Marissa told me that she does it at UC Davis, if that's helpful. Um, since they are doing it. Um, so basically, she allows the students to self-identify whether they are parents or uh, serving in a parenting role. Um, she's been very um, conscious about trying to reduce the barriers and challenges to being, you know, not requiring um, birth certificates, for example, or, you know, a lot of documentation. Um, and I know that, that there's been, you know, some conversation about, you know, the, the number of students who are going to find out about this policy and try to say that they're parenting students when they're not is probably so nil that it's not even really worth the extra effort to administratively or on the parenting student side to really be trying to create a lot of like burden of proof barriers. And so they just kind of do it based on the honor system. And I think that it's a really effective what I've, what I've heard from um, Marissa um, is that since they've been doing it, it's been really effective. She is the transfer student uh, coordinator um, and also the STARS program at UCSC also has a uh, priority registration and they, they do it similarly. Uh, Janet Seha and, uh, and Marissa Weiss are both part of that uh, monthly chat group that I mentioned uh, in my presentation that um, and have talked about their work with priority registration on their campuses a lot and I know um, UC Santa Barbara also has it um, and I believe UCLA. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. Yes, Marissa was great at putting that together. I remember when the flyers went out right before I left, I'm like, that would be awesome. <laughs> Did anybody else want to talk about how they're doing priority registration on their campus or if it's coming out soon? Well, we're not doing priority registration, but for anyone that works at a CSU or works out of campus, I want you to know the behind the scenes of how we started utilizing our student information system, our SIS, which at, you know, in the CSU, it's PeopleSoft, CMS. Um, and students self-identify by working with me. And so they can sign up online or they can send me an email. There's so many ways. Um, you know, if you don't have that form builder on your website, make sure you have a form so they can enter um, who they are. And then we worked with the registrar to create a marker that's called CHLD. You know, there are different identifiers within PeopleSoft. And so um, once we get that data from the student parents, we um, I just request through my contact with the registrar, can you please add these students, the CHLD marker? And it comes up in um, both um, PeopleSoft CMS and in EAB, it's integrated. Thank you so much for sharing that, Haley. Um, so that is our series for today. I thank you all for having me as the moderator. I thank the panelists for sharing so much about the work that each CSU or each campus and organization is doing. But before I pass it on to Miguel for closing remarks, I wanna ask if people feel comfortable, the reason why we're here, we're either we have children or dependents or we're parenting as the, we're parenting in a verb. Maybe we have godsons and goddaughters that we took on. And I just wanna ask, we shot it out our school. So if you guys feel comfortable, I would ask you guys to shout out I'll drop your who you do it for in the chat. I know I do it for two people. If you want to share and bring them into the space, you're more than welcome to. And we could just have a waterfall of, of names. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm sure they appreciate all that you're doing and sacrificing for them. And keep going. Keep going. You're almost done. So I'm going to pass it on to Miguel. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Shade. I love uh, the waterfall of names, uh, truly moving, truly inspiring. Uh, thank you to our audience. Thank you to our panelists for an incredible conversation. Uh, we hope that everybody walks away uh, inspired, that you'll take what you've heard and explore how you can incorporate it into your campuses um, implement some of these innovative solutions, you know, 
Uh, after our first virtual session, uh, we heard that many of you are starting to connect with one another, contacted each other, shared resources. Um, and we think that this broader com community that uh, is emerging is absolutely amazing. So let's keep that conversation going and let's find uh, ways to collaborate. Um, speaking of keeping the conversation going, don't forget to mark your calendars on June 23rd for the third event of our series. Um, we'll share more information on that event as the date approaches, but just as a sneak peek, uh, that session will be a fireside chat with student parents. So it promises to be incredible. Uh, the State of Pregnant and Parenting Students in California was presented by the Michelson 20MM Foundation and Service of Advancing Equity for All Students and Families. We want to thank our partners, Ascend at the Aspen Institute, Blue Shield of California Foundation, California Competes, the Education Trust West, and Tipping Point Community. Shout out to our friends and partners. Uh, thank you for, for making today happen. Uh, we'll post a recording of today's discussion on our YouTube channel, the Michelson 20MM Foundation by tomorrow. If you or your organization wanna become part of our work focused on supporting pregnant and parenting students, please feel free to reach out to me at miguel at 20mm.org. You can also stay engaged by signing up for our newsletter at 20mm.org um, to receive news and updates on uh, upcoming events and uh, programs. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Have a great rest of the day.